continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But then the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered, Father, look, all these years, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Would you pray with me? Lord, we pray that this morning as we open your word, that we would hear your voice. Uh, we pray that we would, uh, that you would take away any words that I might plan to say or want to say that are not from you. Lord, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. Oh Lord, you are our rock and redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Let's be honest. How many of you in that, as you're watching this, are thinking, well, wait a minute. If the father keeps giving her gifts every time she does something wrong, she's just going to keep doing stuff wrong, right? In fact, some of you were thinking what I was, was, man, she's going to start doing things in order to get gifts. And 
one of the things that we're going to find in this um, story in Scripture, which is, for many of us, pretty familiar, is that there's something that flies directly in the face of everything that is logical and normal and human for most of us. Um, as you know, if you've been around, we've been preaching through the book of Acts, and now we're going to take a break for the month of September. Um, but we're, and we're going to stop and talk a little bit about what it means uh, for us to want to take this story, this, this truth about Jesus, this gospel, and share it with other people. And uh, we're going to be introducing um, a phrase um, that, or kind of a, I don't know, a statement that says, we want to, as Thorn Creek Church, we want to um, make disciples of those, the people that we live with, the people we work with, and the people we play with. In other words, we want to be involved in really impacting the people that are out there, that are part of our lives. And I think as we do that, as we spend a few weeks looking at that, you're going to discover that a lot of the way that we think about church in 21st century America doesn't really do that. In fact, we tend to think about church as, oh, you know what? Our, what our church is about is what happens in this building. But the reality is this statement is going to say what we do in this building matters, but not because of what happens in this building. That what we do in this building, we do because we care about the people that we live with, that we work with, and we play with. Now, as we think about that, um, I don't know if you've ever noticed how hard it can be to talk about God, right? I mean, it can be hard to know how to bring up the topic. It can be hard to know how to answer questions. In fact, even if somebody says, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, half the time you get talking with them and you begin to realize that what they mean by that isn't necessarily what we understand it to be, right? Like sometimes you get talking to somebody and they say, oh, yeah, I, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. And as you talk to them, you, you realize that really what they believe in is some sort of Star Wars-ish force that's out there, right? In fact, it's interesting. If you go online, you'll find that atheists are really having a problem right now because atheists can't decide what the definition of an, a of an atheist is. Because people can't really agree on not just whether there's a God, but people can't argue, can't really come to an agreement about how we define God. And the same thing is true in the church. Because our understanding of God is understandably affected by our own background, our own knowledge, our own experience. And yet, even though everybody in our society seems to want to say, well, you believe what you believe about God, and I'll believe what I believe about God, and your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth, but the God of the Bible doesn't allow us that freedom. And, and in fact, if you were to think about it, how crazy is it that we think that somehow each of us can decide who God is and what he's like? Like, if you were to meet somebody and they were to say, oh, hi, my name is Bill, and you were to say, no, no I, I think you're a Fred. Why? It just, it just feels more right to me. And you, then you ask Bill, you say, so where are you from, Bill? Oh, I'm from Nebraska. No, no, you, you seem like to me that you're probably from Massachusetts. I mean, it's crazy. None of us would do that. And yet that's what our society wants to do with God. We want to redefine him and kind of decide on our own who he is. Now, the reason that I go to Luke 15, to this, um, this story of, of, and by the way, I think of this as the parable of the crazy father. Because ultimately the point is not the son. The son matters, but the point is the father and the fact that what he does from a human perspective is crazy. And I think that that's a great place to go because 
you know, the Bible tells us that Jesus had been with God in the beginning. In fact, it's very clear if you study the Old Testament that Jesus was with God before the beginning of time. So if anybody knows the Father, it's the Son. He was the, even non-Christians will say that Jesus was the most God-conscious person ever. So we're going to say, okay, what's the clearest story that Jesus tells about God and who he is? And now I, I want to say two other things as we dig into this. One is that this is bigger than our brains can understand. In fact, the same thing is always true whenever we talk about God because the greatness and the holiness and the majesty and the eternity and all this of God is bigger than we can ever really put into words. In fact, the great theologian Thomas Aquinas said, if you comprehend God, he is not God. In other words, if we begin to think that, the, okay, this is who God is. This is the box I put him in. Then we know that automatically we have proven, we have established the fact that that is not who God is. Because God is greater than our words and our minds. So I want to encourage you to listen to this message with your heart before you listen with your mind. Now, I know that in the Reformed tradition, we have tended to really value the mind. And that's good. But this is a story that speaks to the heart more than it does speak really to the mind. So, in this situation, Jesus has been hanging out with sinners. This is the context in which he tells this story. He's hanging out with sinners, and the religious people are muttering, and they're murmuring. And I, I swear, as you read through scriptures, it, sounds, it seems like the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the religious people, must have spent, you know, 12 hours a day going... Blah, 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 blah. They're always muttering and murmuring and... Blah, 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 blah. Kind of like, you know, your grandpa might have used to do it sometime in your life. And Jesus tells three stories. Now, the first story is about a lost sheep. And, and that story really isn't very offensive because the sheep was lost through its own ignorance. You know, if your sheep wanders off, you, you don't really expect sheep to be smart. I don't know how many of you have been around sheep much, but however stupid you think they are, they are stupider, okay? Or more stupid. I don't know what the word is. But... The sheep is lost through ignorance. And then he tells a story about a lost coin. And obviously it's not the coin's fault, right? Because the coin was lost through somebody else's mistake. In a lot of ways, those first two stories are, are easy. Oh, you know, look at that good shepherd. He went to get his sheep. His sheep didn't know any better. Look at that, you know, woman. She, she found her coin. That's great because it's not the coin's fault. But then he tells a story that totally changes. It totally flips the script because he says, there's a son who went. And, and in fact, the son is more offensive than we even understand in our society. When he goes to his father and says, I would like my inheritance now. Basically what he's saying is to dad is he's saying, hey dad, I wish you were dead. I really wish you would kick the bucket now so I can have your stuff. But since you won't, will you give me your stuff anyway? And I want to tell you that right away, from the very beginning, the people that were listening to this story, as soon as they began to understand what Jesus would say, were saying, they would have been blown away by this. Because the truth is this. God's love is always greater than we think it is. God, God loves us as we are, not as we should be. God's not going to love us more if we live our life right today. He could not possibly love you more than he does now because his love is infinite and perfect. There is nothing you could do that would ever make him love you more or love you less. The truth is that even by using the word love, we are falling short of what God has for you and for me. So let, let's walk through this story. We start with the father. 
A couple things we notice about him. One is he's approachable. You know, the son knows that my father is open enough that I can walk in there and talk to him. And, and that by itself, as soon as the story starts, this is an offensive thing to the original audience. Because, you know, the, the God, they wouldn't even speak his name. And once a year, I think I already said this to you a couple months ago, once a year the high priest would dare to enter into the Holy Holies, Holy of Holies, and whisper the name of God. And that's how distant and holy and far away God was. And Jesus is saying, the son walks right in and says, Dad, here's what I want. But the other thing that we notice about him is that he does have a deep personal connection. I mean, Jesus is saying the relationship between you and God the Father is, is a dad relationship. I mean, that's crazy stuff. And in fact, it's one of the things, if you talk to people who come from other religious backgrounds, non-Christian backgrounds, it's one of the things that they find offensive very often about Christianity. If you talk to Muslims, they, they would never talk about Allah as their loving father. And that relationship between a, a parent and a child you know that feeling every one of us had have, have had some kind of relationship to our parents now you may have had a very broken relationship with your parents but even that breaking hurts why does a broken relationship with a with a parent or with a child, why does it hurt so much? Because the nature of that relationship is so intimate and so close that I think we all know that, that to have that relationship broken, when, when Jesus says he's like a father, Elizabeth Stone was the first one, I guess, who said um, this idea that to make a decision to have a child is momentous. It is to decide to forever have your heart walking around outside your body. And Jesus is saying, that's the way God feels about you. So this son goes in there and he talks to his father and he says, I, I want my property. I, I want my share of the estate. And the father does it. And, and you don't really know, it doesn't tell you why the father did it. And later in the story, we discover the heart of, that, of the father. But then we have the story. And, and again, you have to understand that for the people that are listening, this is crazy. This son goes off. He's already offended his father, cut himself off from the family, taken his stuff off, and he goes and he blows it all. He, he wastes it all until he comes to the point where he has nothing and he gets a job feeding pigs. And for a good Jewish boy, that was like the ultimate. I mean, pigs were unclean. So he's not just, you know, somebody who's got a, an unpleasant job. He has separated himself from his family. He separated himself from his father. He separated himself from the fortune. And he separated himself from God and from his people by being this kind of a guy. And then he came to his senses. And it's interesting because we don't know how long that took. Um, being a guy myself and having talked to a lot of men in my life, I think that probably it took him a while. Because men, for us to admit that we are broken and in need, anybody, any of the women ever notice that men can be stubborn sometimes? Anybody? Any of the men ever notice that my, my wife is holding up her hand more than anybody else? I, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> but to be fair, 
men, any of you ever noticed that women can be stubborn? Okay. But that's not where we're going. So he decides, I'm going to go back. But notice the heart of the son. He's not like, you know what? I bet dad will forgive me. He says, he says you know what? I'm not, and he's, he's developing this crazy story in his mind where he's like, you know what? I will go back and just be a hired hand. And there's this process of decision. And he goes back and you can almost picture him just kind of walking along. And there's a, there's a song that I love, but it's wrong by sidewalk prophets that, you know, come running like a prodigal, as if the son is running back to his father. But that's not what's happening, is it? In fact, if anything, you kind of get the sense that the son is probably shuffling his feet. You know, if it had been me, I probably would have stayed in the next town for a few days trying to get up my courage to come back. There's no sense in which the son is coming back with excitement and joy and confidence. That's not the point of the story. If the point, if you think that the point of the story is how the son comes running back to the father and it's like some old corny romantic movie where the son's running and the father's running and they run into each other and no it's the father who says the father saw him was filled with compassion for him and he ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him and Again, you have to understand, in that society, men, especially wealthy men, did not run. He would have been wearing a robe that went down around his legs. And in order to run, he would have had to literally kind of pick up his robe. And this is not a very masculine, fatherly, in control kind of thing to do. And Jesus is describing the God and the Father of Yah I mean Yahweh, the creator of the universe, as picking up his robe and running to his son. I mean, do you see the contrast between that and the Old Testament? The, 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 now, I want to be clear. God is God. And, and we can spend some time sometime talking about how, you know, even though there are some differences in the way that, that God is portrayed in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God is still God, okay? He didn't change. But the understanding of the people of who God was, was crazy different in this point. I mean, this God is insanely generous. And he comes running. And, you know, I don't know if the son's like, ah, dad's got, you know, has he got a gun under that robe, you know? What's he going to do? And the, he takes him in his arms and he hugs him. And he has a party. And what does that tell us about God's love? And please understand, don't hear this as a doctrinal thing. Don't think about this as a statement about how God loves mankind. It's very significant that this is a story about God and his child. It is very legitimate to put yourself as an individual right into this story and for you to connect and relate with the Son. So this is what God's love for you is like. Number one, it's not a response to what the younger son did. I mean, the younger son is, in, is kind of rehearsing his speech. He's got it all written up in his head. And the father never even gives him a chance to give the speech. God's love for you is not a response for anything that you could ever do. God's love is doesn't come from you and who you are. It flows from who God is. God is love, First John tells us. God's love is based on what he finds in himself. The son didn't have to get his life together to, in order to be loved by the father. In fact, they tell me that if you go to France um, on Easter Sunday... 
You know what they say? They say, l'amour de Dieu est folie. Which I don't know French. That's pretty much the, l'amour de Dieu est folie. The love of God is folly. And that might sound crazy. I mean, I'm talking about this as the crazy father. But that's what we're talking about. The love of God for you is crazy. It's it's bigger than you think it is. And and, in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul writes, I pray that you may have the power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and high and long and deep is the love of God. And and think about that. Wide and high and long and deep. Okay, an object has how many dimensions? Three. He's saying wide and high and long and deep. He's saying it's bigger than than this world that we can comprehend. It's wide and it's high and it's long and it's deep and it's bigger. And the next verse in Ephesians 3 says that that same God who loves us that way is able to do immeasurably more than all that we could hope or imagine or ask or think depending on your translation. Do you see how big God's love for you is? I I guarantee you there are a number of people watching this on their computer and sitting in this room today who have somehow learned very often because of the way you were treated, maybe by your own earthly father or your mother or the situation or whatever, you have learned that you would be loved more if you were better. If I was more like my brother... I would be loved more. If I would stop doing this, I would be loved more. This story says that is a lie. And this is a story told by Jesus, who knew the Father better than anybody ever. So what do you do with that? Well, there's two responses in this story. First one is, you receive it. You just receive grace. I mean, what's the natural response of the son in the, in the story? We don't know how he responds, but what would be the natural response? No, no, Dad, I, I'm not worthy. You don't understand. Please understand, the son was in deep. Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me your stuff. I blew it all. I'm feeding the pigs. I'm doing all kinds of stuff. According to that, the the society that he was in, he was worthy of death. And even when he turns around to come home, do you realize that his motivation for coming home is kind of mixed? He says, oh, I'm going to go home because I'll have a better life there. We don't even know that necessarily he, he's all that repentant, although it's in the speech. There's two key moments. He realizes his need, and then he receives grace. And I want to ask you, and I, I, whether you're sitting in the room or you're watching this at home, Have you realized your need for the love of God? And secondly, have you received that? Now, the logical question is this. Doesn't this lead to abuse? I mean, surely the son's going to think, Oh, cool. I can do whatever I want, and it'll be fine. Let's be honest. How many of you in the room today, that crossed your mind when we were doing the children's message? Quite a few hands. Let's think about it this way. Let's say that you're a young man, you're single, and you meet the girl of your dreams. I mean, she is beautiful. She is funny and smart and personable. And and she's everything you've ever thought a woman, a girl should be. And you're like, this... I can't wait to take her home and introduce her to my parents. She, oh, she's great. And you come to the point where you're like, you know what? 
I love this. I love this woman. And so you take her out to a really nice restaurant, and you know it's really it's it's really special. And you tell her, "I love you." Would you marry me? She says yes. At that point, is this young man going to think yes? She loved me. She married. She's going to marry me. I can treat her like trash now because she's in. I caught her. Of course not. If that's the response of the father of the young man, then he doesn't love her. The response to love is love. It's to say, I want to give everything. And I tell you, the power of pure love is so deep and so intense. I remember back when I was in college, I worked one summer at Camp Manitoba. And the first week of the year, um, of the summer, we had what we called mentally impaired week. It was all um, ad young adults and adults from um, a lot of them from Elam, um, the residential programs. And, and we, I was, uh, actually, I shared a cabin with Dave Eisenbart, who's the pastor at Living Springs now. And we had two guys in our cabin, and so, some of you may know them, I guess, who were gigantic guys. Both guys were like 6'4", 6 6'5", 6 280 pounds of hugeness. And one guy was a guy named Roger. And Roger was like, nah, I ain't gonna do it. Whatever we did, Roger was a good guy, but he just didn't want to do anything. And then we had a guy named Danny who was just this gentle, caring guy. And he, all week long, he'd go up to people, he'd take their hand in his, and he'd say, you know what? And we'd say, what, Nanny? He'd say, that's what. <laughs> and he's just such a sweet, kind guy. And as the week went along, Roger kind of made fun of Danny. And generally, it didn't bother Danny much, but Danny, as the week went on, you could tell that he was starting to kind of be hurt in his heart. And the last night we were together in, in the cabin... And people were kind of laughing at Danny a little bit. And again, both these guys are huge. And um, Danny gets up and goes over to Roger and takes his hand and says, Roger, you know what? And I'm thinking, uh, it's going to get ugly here. I'm glad that Dave's a college football player. And Roger says, What? Danny says, I love you. And he goes back and he sits down. And the whole room changed. Because true love that isn't a result of any response that is just love changes everything. First thing we can do is we can respond to that love by accepting it. Second thing we can do is we can reject it. I mean, look at the older brother here in the story. There is something in our pride that's offended by this insanely generous grace. I mean, look at the older son. He's the embodiment of the American work ethic, right? Those of you that can remember this far back, this is John Houseman saying, we make money the old-fashioned way. We earn it few of you remember that. Churches in America are filled with people who say, well, I've been here for 87 years. Translation, I've earned it. No, you haven't. The older son assumes the worst. Think about that. He says, well, my, my brother wasted his money on loose living. and Does he know that? No. There's no evidence that he knows anything about what his brother has done. He just 
assumes the worst, and his offense is that he comes face to face with an extravagant, overwhelming, unending fountain of love flowing from the Father, and he says, no, I don't want that. He rejects a love that loves you as you are, not as you should be. We can do that, folks. However much you think God loves you, He loves you more than that. So, what are the results of glimpsing, glimpsing God's love? Well, notice a couple things. It, scripture tells us, first of all, if we really understand God's love, we become confident. First John says that perfect love casts out fear because we're not scared. What if they stop loving me? There's no fear that says, oh no, what, what if I, you know, what if I get mad at God and I say, you know, God, I don't want to follow you anymore. And then I get hit by a truck. Oh no, you know what? If the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has adopted you as his child, tell me, parents, if your kid flipped you off and left the room screaming and then got hit by a truck, would you be like, well, not my son? No. We become confident. We become lovable. I love what St. Augustine said. He said, in loving me, you made me lovable. Once we receive that love, we begin to be transformed by it. Another thing is that we have a freedom to use our gifts. I no longer have to succeed for God to love me. I love this, and I, I have trouble in my heart living this out. But did you know that if this sermon stinks, and you don't like it, and you don't like me, God will still love me? If you get up to sing a song and it falls apart and it's just, oh, and you're awful, God will still love you. If you try to tell somebody about Jesus and you don't know the answer and you say something wrong and you fall, God will still love you. In fact, the amazing thing about this God is he says, you know what? You bring what you have to me and I will use it. I, I've known, I, I've heard all kinds of stories about people who are like, well, I... Well, here's a good way to think about it. Numerous times in my life, I have gotten up, preached a sermon, and afterwards somebody says to me, well, this is exactly what I needed to hear. And then they say what they heard, and I'm like, I don't think I said that. But God apparently did. There's a freedom from condemnation even though we are guilty. Please understand, Christianity is not a thing that says, you know, oh, it doesn't matter if you put your foot through the drywall. It doesn't matter if you stole ten dollars. That's not what they're saying. What the Christianity is about is the fact that we can be declared forgiven, guilty but forgiven, and made new because we have been adopted as children of God because Jesus paid the price. I miss Pam here this morning because she would have said amen right there. I want to ask you straight up, do you believe that God loves you as you are, not as you should be, regardless of worthiness, unworthiness, regardless of faithfulness or unfaithfulness? Do you believe that there is no place you can run that is too far to come back? Do you believe that he loved you at the moment you were conceived and every moment since, that when you got up this morning, he was loving you, he's loving you right now, and every moment between now and tonight, he will continue to love you regardless of what you do. He loves you without caution or regret, without boundary, limit, or breaking 
point. He loves you with a love that is always greater than anything you could believe or expect. It's a love that surpasses knowledge. Do you believe that you owe him every moment, every, mo every motive, every beat of your heart? Do you believe that you could pour out every bit of this day and every day in grateful, joyful, loving service to him? And yet he would continue to give himself to you in a way that far surpasses what you've done. I talked a few weeks ago about climbing in the offering plate, which is kind of a weird thing because we don't actually have one right now. But do you understand that I could never give anything to God that would even begin to measure up to what he has given to me? We are getting ready to start some things this fall. And, um, and, and we're going to need some people to help out. You know, we want to start next week having greeters. Now, I know we can't shake hands and hug, but we want everybody that walks in the door on a Sunday morning to feel like, wow, they're glad I'm here. So we're going to want people to greet, but not greet because the program list or we needed somebody to sign up. To, we want people to greet because of the love of God. We want people to help with children's ministry. We're, we're getting ready to start up cadets and gems. Don't help out just because Dan Oldenkamp begged you. Help out because God loves you and God loves these children. We want to help with youth. Justin's looking for some people to help with student ministries. Don't help Justin because he needs help. Help Justin because God loves you and those young people. What, what if we got that in our brains? I mean, real, and what if we got it in our hearts and we were gripped by love? 1 Corinthians 5 says, Christ's love compels us. Compels us. I, I want to encourage you to do a couple things. One is if you have never thrown your arm yourself into the arms of the Father, do that. It's better than anything you could ever dream of. If you have not been finding ways to pour your life out in gratitude, I encourage you. And I know there are some of you who are at a point in your life when you're like, I can't really do anything. You know, I, I had somebody say to me recently, I can't really even help with the nursery because, you know, I'm too old. You can pray for people. I got a note, and I'm not going to say who it was from, although many of you would will guess who this was from a, a saint in this church who said I haven't been able to come to church yet but I want you to know that I've been praying for you every day and I've mentioned that to a couple different people and they said oh if she says she's praying for you she's actually praying for you some of you know who I mean give what you can give and the last thing I want to say is if you have kind of wandered away a little bit from the Father, maybe you've never come home. Maybe you've wandered away. I think it's interesting that the Father, that the Son belonged to the Father. And then he left. But I want to invite you home. Because it's good to be home.